everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, so you are all here to um, listen to amazing advices and story from Apari today. And the brand Apari, which a lot of you know, is not only an amazing vegan brand and one of the brands that I personally love, but it's also very personal to Flying Solo because I don't know if you guys know, but they started with us when Flying Solo was literally at the very beginning, the first day when we opened doors, Apri was there with us. It was quite a journey, like how the whole brand developed and they were certainly not in the same shape and form um, at the time when they join us that they have now. So I want, uh, so uh, uh, Emily today, she's a CEO and co-founder uh, of Apari and uh, she will tell you the story of the brand. We'll also have some time for Q and A's at the end. And uh, yeah, welcome. background I know that you Apari is now I guess a little over seven years old just like, yeah uh, just like flying solo and if you can share your background and how it's all came along hi everyone um, uh, thanks for coming today um, I uh, well let me give you a little bit of my background info I think it will be useful um, in the conversation I was Born and raised in France, um, came to the US in 2006 for my MBA degree. Um, and um, I worked for about 10 years in corporate finance for French luxury brands. Uh, when I was there, I, I learned um, about you know, finance, inventory planning, um, retail management, uh, and business development. So that's my background. And in 2016, I um, I quit my job and uh, launched a ferry with Lauren, my co-founder. She wanted to be here with us today, but she's she's in Paris. And um, but she's saying hi to all of you. Uh, we um, and even if I were corporate for um, for a while, I always knew I wanted to launch a brand at some point and be an entrepreneur. Um, I, um, so it was always in the back of my mind. And so when we launched a ferry, we didn't have a clear idea of what, what it would be. Um, Lauren is my creative co-founder, I'm more on the business side, uh, but we thought we would be complimentary. And we are very complimentary uh, to this date. Um, when we met very early on, we launched in 2016, so I think yeah. we met in 17, right? I, I think we met in 16 in June. It's, okay, so we yeah. met very at the beginning. Uh, we had no money whatsoever when we launched this business, but really no money. We had a few connections, but you know, it wasn't really useful at the time, but we we met uh, Elizabeth, Lauren and I didn't even have enough money to start our own brand. So we were, at the time, we were, um, we were importing um, small indie brands from France. And one of the, like, that brand we had was a collab with Venice Wu, and it was a, a vegan shoe brand that was really cool. And we're still friends with her at this time. Uh, but that's how we started with shoes. And then we had a little bit of ready to wear, and um, finally we, we worked with you know we were at Flying Solo for a while. Finally, we had enough funds to open a pop up shop in Williamsburg. Is it, is it too long? No, we <laughs> is like so we're here to listen to your story because it's truly amazing. And um, we partner. We found another designer uh, that with whom we could split that store because it was still expensive and in that pop-up shop we had all kind of um, products and so on but we had a little line of faux fur coats and they kept you know they kept selling out and we really kept selling out and we kept making a little bit more we found a manufacturing partner that would allow us to make very few like a dozen at a time so that's all we were doing and at the end of 2017 we got a phone call from Bloomingdale's 
uh, the fashion director of Green Dales, who asked us to present them our line of fur coats for the following market, which was in, in February. Um, and we said, yes, of course. Um, and we had no collection, obviously. Uh, we had no funds to, you know, to start, but we, Lorraine managed to put together a collection. I called Elizabeth and begged her to lend me the keys to present at your respiratory store on downstairs. Um, and uh, we, you know, we managed to put together a collection in a few weeks of, you know, vegan outerwear. So it was mostly full fur, like very colorful full fur coats, um, vegan, um, vegan chilling, and um, and so we presented it at Flying Solo, and they bought the entire collection, uh, which was a really, you know, happy moment, haha moment. And then on, on this, we, we felt there was a momentum, so. Whatever funds we had, we um, we got like a, a booth at Coterie, uh, which was our largest expenses, and it was the smallest booth in the entire show. It was a ten by ten. We covered it in bright pink so people could see us, <laughs> and it was a huge hit. Like to like it was we managed to have orders for all the retailers we could dream of. Um, uh, Shop up, revolve, um, intermix, sometimes sacks, um, and so I think it was about 200 retailers. Which was, I was just telling Elizabeth before meeting you guys. I think it was looking back, it was um, a mix of luck, but also having the right product at the right time. We felt very edited to buyers. They understood it. It was for for notes. Um, and um, and the price point was attractive, so we really like there was really nothing like it in the market at, at the moment. And so fur fur coats, fur fur coats, uh, full fur. So we are uh, Paris yeah, is is a hundred percent vegan. We do not use fur. We do not use wool. Um, we do not use shearling. Uh, we want to really use silk. So anything that's made of uh, animal um, these fabrics. We're, not using it's our uh, it's been our choice since the beginning of the brand and it still is. Um, so that was in uh, in early 2018, and um, I, I like take, having a purchase order is great, but it's 10% of the journey because you have to fulfill these orders, you have to shift your client, you have to have enough funds to survive perhaps like like nine, ten months. Because by the time you ship your retailers, they're you're still gonna wait another 30, 60 days before they pay you. So it's it's excruciating pain uh, <laughs> from a financial standpoint. Um, and then you know then in, in 2018 we started building our team, um, our financial backings um, processes, softwares, and all those things. We're now, um, we're sold in um, over 20 countries, uh, mostly in, in the US and Western Europe. Um, and, and I think like we, we stayed true to our first idea of uh, making vegan fashion uh, with, um, at an attainable price point without compromising style. So this is I love story. Thank you for that. Yeah, it's very. It's, uh, I know that in reality it was significantly longer. So I'm only just point out the key facts, like of the story of Apuri. And for me, um, of Lying Solo, one of the most amazing things, and I guess that's how we saw it uh, on our side, was that when um, Apari decided to switch from footwear to clothing, they created the entire collection. So they were, uh, uh, they were dresses, they were tops, they were uh, skirts, and there was a f um, four fur coat. And I think at the time you had only one color, that was mustard, I remember. Yeah, there, and um, it was presented 
around um, like winter time. I don't know, remember what month. And it was literally one item that was constantly sold out for us too. And that was that mustard coat. And I feel this is the definition um, of the right mindset, at least for me, because um, a lot of designers, we had a lot of designers at the time, I think, I mean, way less than we had now, but it was still like 45 designers, I believe, uh, in Flying Solo. So for a lot of designers, when one thing was selling and the remaining, whatever, like 15 SKUs were not, they always felt like a failure. For them, it was like, well, my entire collection is a failure, only one thing sells. Reality of Flop Re was they found that niche that was selling, so they were excited that there is one thing that is definitely selling. So uh, let's build the entire brand on this. And I really think that it's fascinating that the whole brand was basically built from the fur coat, like for yeah. fur. Yeah, so for a long time after they already became too big for us for flying soul and departed from us, the entire collection was the different colors and then it became a little different shapes and like, I think the whole collection of um, dresses and other accessories came a little later. Uh, but for a good while, that was the core product. And, uh, and again, I think the amazing thing is they didn't see it as failure. They saw it as a success because there was one thing that made, they made it work and they built the entire brand from that. And I also think that one of the most fascinating from our perspective was that they saw how to brand themselves. I mean, uh, all your brands like stand for like, uh, talking to designers like for different values and uh, it could be that it's handmade as well as like you know source from like a certain material and everything but there is times when things appeal to the market and for it was vegan fur that was on the verge of becoming popular and they were the first ones at least to my knowledge that started the whole trend here in new york so they saw that this is the main thing and that they should roll with and uh yeah i think that's how they became successful so again thank you thank you like you know for doing it this way i think um just to like to complete what you were saying, I think the opportunity to be working at Flying Solo, it was invaluable for like really narrowing down the product because, you know, we were here like working, chatting with customers, but also observing what they were looking at. And they're like, they may not be purchasing, but they're interested, like they want to touch it, like they're attracted to the colors. And I think it was a valuable experience for us to be able to listen to the customer, um, like on you know on a, on a daily basis. Even now, whenever we have an opportunity to be either at one of our retailers or when we have pop-ups, like we are there, like because we we want to hear what they have to say. Is it too short? Is it too much? Is it how does it feel? Like like all this feedback is just so important, and it's. You know, early on, that was a really great like um, thing to have to launch the business. Yeah, and um, I know that that question is asked a lot of times by designers. So, how do you define who your audience is? I'm sure at the beginning you imagine one client, and then it becomes another client. So, how do you def how did you define uh, who your client is, and how did you market to them? So, what was the process? Um, I think it was, um, it was a lot of like, as I just said, like listening to the client and observing her and talking to her. I think by having this conversation with our early customers, we understood that like she could be like, you know, a Gen Z, but she could also be like a mom who, who has like a daughter, like a cool mom who has a daughter in, in college and she's wearing golden golden gooses and she's like she's got you know some some disposable income and wants to like buy like fun you know a fun product that she perceives as not too expensive compared to what she's usually buying so we were like we had those like really meaningful exchange with, with customers and that that gave us an idea like to narrow down who she is um, and um, 
we've you know we've also done like some you know interviews like like formal more formal interviews with customer panels and so on but that that live you know reaction and that live interaction is still what gives like us the best understanding of our audience yeah amazing and what comes first i mean it's like kind of chicken and egg problem like what comes first like the marketing to the client or figuring out who the client is and then marketing to them because first you need to market to someone in order to attract that audience and even with the pop-up that you are doing you are selecting uh locations for a reason right like mm -hmm. it was appealing to a certain demographic so how did you approach that yeah, what comes first? Yeah, <laughs> what comes first? A great question. Um, I think it's it's an iteration process again. Like it's it's we've we've done tons of mistakes, um, and we've had like pop ups in like random locations, and um, we've uh, we've launched like product categories that just really didn't really make sense. Looking back, we've we've done tons of like and 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 I think at the end of the day, it's it's really being able to uh, allow yourself to make those mistakes in a certain framework um, you still want to exist um, but it exists as a, as a brand um, but um, but yeah until, until you narrow down who your, your client is and who's who, like what's your core who's your core client I think the way we are showing it in our you know little brand book we have is that we have we know we have this core client she's like it's very clear to us she's like lives in like a large urban city like new york chicago even l.a uh she's in her 30s like she's um uh she likes to shop on revolve or like shop bar but she like she likes to discover new brands it's like our core client but we have like like four other personas of like Type of clients that we have that we know but they're not our core clients so when, whenever we have a marketing message we're you know we are targeting our core client and we understand that the others are also um, going to join mm -hmm. and how do you approach that I, I know that there is the whole science of like how you uh, describe your core clients sometimes you even name them and how do you uh, define the further steps to approach that client if you can share a little bit of the process of operating how you guys do it um, yeah I think uh, well there's, there's different ways of you know talking to her and building that community around your brand your products and your values um, I think there's you know I think first and foremost, it's really important to have a genuine message um, in, for creating that community. Um, if it feels that it's you know it's not fully it's a marketing message, people just don't get it. They just don't care about it, right? So our you know our mission around developing vegan fashion, which specifically has like it had to be crafted in a way that's you know. People can understand it, they can relate to it, they understand why it's important to us, but also why you know we're building this community around us. Um, and we started like this, and then, and then obviously online is can be you know difficult to pass on that message. So there's you know multiple ways that you all know, obviously the you know the ones we all know on social media and, and you know online in general that could be. I mean, they're really difficult. Uh, we felt always that live events and live interaction has been the best way for us to build our community, and that's probably why like we still have a good chunk of our like business here in New York because this is where we've done the most grassroots um, actions. Mm -hmm. And what's, um, I mean, I obviously saw your posters all over the city when you do like really cool campaigns. Um, and um, what's, what's your, for advertising, how do you uh, decide what the marketing is going to be for the next, I don't know, quarter or however you budget it? So what, what's the process behind that? And what tools do you currently use? Do you work with influencers or influencers and no-no for your brand or any insight in that process? Okay, full disclaimer, I'm not a marketer, so uh, I'll just repeat what my marketing team is saying. <laughs> um, 
So in terms of like marketing spend, I think there's been um, many brands have relied on paid search and paid social on an acquisition model in, you know, until maybe like a year or two ago, where, you know, you would say, okay, I, I want to, I want to acquire new customers, and like you were advertised on, um, on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, this world. And it's been a model that worked for a lot of brands for a while, um, but it's a model that just doesn't work anymore. And for some reason now that it's, uh, you know, it's the algorithm on Facebook, I won't get too much in details around it, but it, it's not, it's an expensive, like advertising model, basically, and it's not one that's going to yield you a loyal, right? Um, so when we decide, you know, to, to get back on how we decide on our um, marketing budget and advertising budget, we try to have the right mix of uh, what we call like positive, like um, ROAS positive marketing, meaning that if we're going to spend $10 on marketing, we're looking to make 20. So what does it mean? So obviously I was talking about paid search and social that usually yields you a higher return than what you spend. Um, but it's also um, like, you know, it could be like events that like a customer event that you're doing, you're putting together a nice customer event. It costs you, you know, the cost of champagne, the cost of like, um, like food and kind of pay, but you know that it's going to cost you five hundred dollars, and then you're going to get like two thousand dollars in sales. So it's worth it, right? So this is like purely marketing, like revenue generating uh, marketing, and and that's important. I think this is something that you like, like you need, like because you need to you know grow your business and your brand, uh, but also brand building marketing. Uh, and that is the most challenging one because you're not seeing a return out of it and it's expensive and um, we just went through like a whole rebranding um, of you know our website our brand identity and so on and and you just don't see a return right away but you know that you're investing for the future and for the long run and that at some point it will pay off but you can't really measure it uh, right now, so we, we try to split this um, to split these two budgets like quite like equally in order to build the future as much as financing the future the the present. Mm -hmm. And do you work with influencers? Yes, we do. Uh, we work with influencers for a long time. We refuse to pay influencers because we're like like you know what if they like it, we're gonna gift it to them, and if they like it, they wear it. Like we. We also wanted, again, our message to be genuine. So that worked for a while, but like more recently, they're like, nope, like we're, you know, <laughs> we should be paid. So we, are, we work with influencers, but we're very mindful of the alignment, mm -hmm. um, their, you know, their community, the alignment, um, we're, you know, and, and, and their fee. I mean, it's, it's you know, it's, can become very expensive and um, very fast, surprisingly. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes I'm very surprised of the the fee that they like the command, but it's you know it's it's a business also. Um, so we're, we're we're trying to be mindful with this and be very careful because some brands have you know that we know, like have overspent on influencer. I thought yeah. they would blow it blow it up, but it just didn't work. And do you still uh, do you apply the same model of positive ROI uh, on uh, on investment yeah, with influencers? So do you see it more as a branding thing or That's a good question? Um, I always ask them like how like are they going to bring us sales? Um, and I think so. We're I've stopped asking that question because. Um, it's it's hard to predict, uh, and the ones that you don't expect that will bring you, you know, sales are the ones that actually do. I don't know if that makes sense. What I'm saying, but like it's, it's hard to predict. Um, so we're you know our work with influencers is you know we, we consider it as a brand building initiative and a community building initiative more than more than um, you know our right positive.
farming. And uh, I also re recently noticed by, by a few people in New York, I don't know if you want to share some on it. I know that you give out either your um, leftover pieces of for fur to like local designers because I did see that uh, they promoted you in uh, return. Was that collaboration successful? I, I saw a few local designers doing yeah, it. Yeah, uh, we partner, we, we did a couple of partnership to um, to work with our um, scrap fabrics. Uh, we work with design school. We also work with uh, actual schools, like elementary school, to have like programs for the like arts and craft projects. Uh, with everything that we do, we're trying. You know, we're, we're mindful of the environment. I think it really is aligned with our overall brand ethos. Uh, we're, you know, we try always trying to reuse our fabrics whenever we have scrubs. We are. Uh, we're being very careful our, of the inventory at the end of the season to not have too much inventory. Uh, for the little story, when uh, COVID hit, uh, we had bought way too many fabrics of like four for fabrics. We just didn't know what to do with it. And Lauren, my co-founder, started like ask our factory to make like a few blankets because that would, that would be like how the most full fur that we could use, right? Like, it's just like, we use a large amount, so we're like, okay. And, and we start selling those blankets and they keep selling out. And so we started making more and more, and we're like, oh, that's probably a temporary thing. Um, and um, and that, that, that ended up becoming a full product category in what we do, we this big, fluffy, full fur, um, full fur uh, blankets. Uh, but that, that started because we didn't want to waste fabric, so we're still very committed to this. So it was basically a happy accident that so yeah. we must trust the category. Yeah. And if you do, don't mind any of the, what you believe that was a mistake in a product category that you created and you're like, okay, we thought it's a good idea, but it just really didn't pan out this way. Yeah, um, like certainly ready to wear. So. Um, like spring ready to wear, we did. Um, we're like we're very seasonal in what we do, and it's, it's extremely hard to navigate when you have seasonality. I don't know if some of you are designing like summer products or swimsuit or anything that has seasonality, but it's extremely challenging from a, like a business like a growth perspective to be so seasonal. So we're like, okay, so let's let's launch a product line that is like like spring summer, right? Like because we're really close, like so that we have something to sell during those months. And we made this like cute like collection of like um, vegan silk um, like tops, like bottoms, and so on. And you know what? As much as it made sense for us from a business perspective, it made no sense to our customers. They just like, they were like, okay, whatever. Just another silk set. You know, I can find the same thing somewhere else or whatever. So it just didn't make sense to them. And so we did that season for spring, summer, and we realized that, you know, like our client really didn't care about it. She just didn't care. And, um, and we pulled back. We like, we stopped making a spring, summer collection, you know, and we have a little bit of ready to wear at the moment, which is more like winter ready to wear. Um, not a lot, um, but we still want to redevelop. So, like when you know, I was talking about making mistakes, uh, and that was a mistake. And I think the key is to like be reactive. I'm like, okay, this is you know, not overreacting, but like read the numbers. Like if it's not selling, just you know, don't you know, it's make a decision but like it's uh, there's a reason and find a reason for us we it didn't make sense to our client and um so yeah that was that was like a mistake that we had. I see. And um, what's your thoughts on uh, direct-to-consumer versus wholesale? I know that you guys do both, and there is a reason for that. What What would you say designers need to think about as when approaching wholesale, or the other way around? Like, what's the challenges of direct-to-consumer? So I, I know that you have a lot of wisdom to share on that. Yeah, maybe like not wisdom, but like strong opinion uh, <laughs> because we had a lot of people coming to us and telling us you should be only DTC or you should only be and 
We always believe that we should be balanced in some way, that it's, it's healthy to have a balanced distribution. Uh, because there are ups and downs, like like retailers, you know, like the sex and grooming deals of this world. Sometimes they're doing well, sometimes they're not doing well. And 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 sometimes DTC is is doing better for you know some reason. So it, it's I'm deeply you know I I really think that it's, it's a good idea to have both and to develop both alongside, which is very hard, but. You know, being able to do some DTC through your website and some flying solo and managing to have like a couple of boutiques through wholesale, I think it gives you a good way to first dip your toes and in both environment, understand the challenges of both, and and be able to scale in, in a meaningful way um, in the future. Yeah. Thank you for that. And the last question I'm going to ask you before I open questions to the audience is like, what advice would you give yourself like um, that when you you, know, you, um, you started the brand like seven and a half years ago, like what do you know now that you like, okay, this piece is very crucial. I wish Emily at the time knew that. <laughs> it's a tough one, right? No, so many things. Uh, I think, you. like, don't be too harsh on yourself. Um, sometimes building something great takes time. Um, like, it's, it shouldn't compare to the success or like of success of others. I think everybody have their own journey and their own you know, way to build a brand. Um, mistakes are okay. Um, and like, be realistic when, when something like realistic and, 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 and flexible. I think there's, um, there's, you know, many factors that you can control, but also many factors that you can't control uh, that are coming together and and you need to listen to those and, and be reactive if, if something changes. So this is all the things I would tell me. Yeah, that, that's a really good advice. Thank you so much. Thank you. So I have another question. So if you have a question, please raise your hand and we'll, uh, and Anna will answer. Yes? Um, what are your thoughts on vegan lover? Yes. Um, so, when we started the brand, uh, we had a little bit of vegan leather, um, and we were not very happy with it. We were not very happy with the quality, the sustainability aspect to it, um, like and the feel of it. So we, we had a little bit of vegan leather, didn't love it. Since 2000, so since our first collection, we've worked with our fabric mills uh, to develop better alternatives. And right now in the market, so we're using a blend of recycled poly for our vegan leather and plant-based um, vegan leather. So it's made out of corn. Uh, we're actually launching today a collab with Metzor Gabriel, oh. uh, and they're known for their leather goods, right? So we, you know, we, like, we work together on the collab on their iconic leather handbags, and we work on our vegan leather coats. And the entire collection is made of um, of plant-based, like we call it bio-based, bio-based uh, vegan leather. My opinion is as as of today, I think it's an amazing alternative uh, to leather. I also think that having work in luxury leather at luxury leather retailers for a long time. I've visited tanneries. Uh, I've visited a lot of tanneries for the brands and um, always thought there, there should be something better for the environment because of the tanning process. Uh, the people who work in the tanneries and obviously the animal uh, that you know are being killed for the leather. So as a brand, as a company, we, we believe that um, the the the, the, um, the movement that has been around not using real fur a couple of years ago 
is, is shifting toward leather, and there are now some much better alternatives to leather. Thank you for that. Thank you. We could talk about that for 10 hours. <laughs> <laughs> like <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Any other questions? Yes. So um, how do you know when you're ready? Like, I don't know if since the beginning you did wholesale, mm -hmm. or how do you know like what uh, sales channel you're ready for? Or like, if it's better to do like concept stores or your own store or wholesale, like for example, in wholesale, how do you know how many you like? What if you have a lot of uh, sales and then you cannot produce them? You know? So how do you manage that? Um, I don't think there's a ha moment um, where you're like, okay, that's it, I'm ready. Um, I think I think there's an ideal world where you have figured out all your products, your manufacturing, your sourcing, your supply chain, and you're like, that's it, I'm ready for wholesale, let's present it to the buyers, and they buy, and you're ready, and so on. So that, that would be ideal, maybe it happens to some brand, that wasn't my experience. Um, uh, but I do think, though, that you need a couple of things to start wholesale, like in a realistic way. I think it starts with a great product. Be convinced that your product is great and they're going to want it because there's nothing like it out there. Uh, I think just just that is, is important. Um, having figured out some of, like, scale manufacturing is important. Um, having at least one factory that you know is willing to work with you, I think is important. We've, it's been very important to us. When we started with our uh, factory, we were making 10 at a time, I was telling you, and, um, and we're still working with them. And so it makes it like a lot more, but we're still working with them and they've, like, they've backed us, you know, and, and they've like, in a way that they, like, they supported us when we needed like smaller quality quantities, they've, they've always supported us. So I think those two things are really important. The rest is great to have, um, but I don't think necessary. I think there's a lot of things you can figure out. Um, so, you know, wholesale comes in different shapes and sizes. I think it could be as small as like working with like a multi-brand boutique um, around the corner that really is seeking like up and coming designers and willing to make a bet on, um, on you and it could be as big as like a major department store so I think it's um, I think there's, there's different ways to approach it and there's no there's no moment where you feel like you know that's it <laughs> I have everything that it takes it's, uh, yeah and uh, I have a follow-up question here something that I discussed prior to the panel like so what's the biggest advantages of disadvantages of both a wholesale and uh, direct to consumer yes um, let's start with wholesale because we were just talking about wholesale um, the biggest advantage is that you can start scaling your brand at with you know little resources um, it's a big if it's like you, you do need financing of your peers, but let's say you get a number of orders from like reputable retailers, um, which we did, that was actually our experience. We had a bunch of peers, but no money uh, to produce because you need to produce for them, right? So you have those peers, you can, you can go see with some of you may know, like a factory agency and just present them those peers and say, listen, like I need to manufacture for these retailers, will you lend us the money? And that's what they do, they lend money to designers to uh, finance production. It's expensive, but you know, when you don't have anything else, you like can take it. Um, and so I think it's, it's a great way to like, to be able to like, you know, launch it in a bigger way. And um, the other thing is that you, you're going to acquire customers through there. If, you know, when we have a, like when we did customer surveys, we noticed that a lot of our clients discovered us at Bloomingdale for like one year, and then the next year she came on our website. She was curious. She said, "What else we sell?" And like she, you know, started to interact with the brands and coming to our events. So we actually like acquired a lot of customers through wholesale, so which is great. And it's also 
that client who sees you on the racks at department stores, um, she, yeah, she's gonna want to interact with the brand. She's gonna look if you legit, like she's going to like, you know, and it's free marketing. I mean, it's, it's free marketing for you. So I think those are the two big advantages of working on wholesale. Uh, what's the rest of the question? Uh, disadvantages of a wholesale and advantages of deep oh this, this is going to be long. Disadvantages <laughs> is, uh, is um, like the, it's difficult. <laughs> wholesale can be difficult to navigate. There's, um, you know, they sometimes change their minds and they're definitely the big fish against you for the, the big ones. Uh, and and your margins are great. So if you know if you sell, if your retail price on the dress is a um, thousand, you know is a thousand dollars, you're gonna have to sell it to them at uh, I can't do the math right now. Uh, if you if you're yeah, if it, if if your dress is five hundred dollars, you're gonna to want to sell it to them for for two hundred dollars. So they're going to sell it for five hundred, but you're going to sell it to them at two hundred, which is you know a big chunk of your margin. And after that, they're going to ask you to participate to their expenses, their freight and labeling and chargebacks and so on. So it's very costly to work with them. The margins all great. And I think that the biggest drawback is like when you build your model and your pricing for retail, is it going to make sense for wholesale, right? So they, they also discount a lot and you have to work with the discounting. It's, it's, it's complicated. Um, so what is the percentage, like the margin you need to have for wholesale? Like how do you calculate? Your own margin or the retail margin? Your own. Your own margin. Um, it's, um, I think it depends from brand to another. Um, but, you know, as a rule of thumb, I would say, uh, like a product that is going to cost you, I'll give you like a random example. A product that is going to cost you at a hundred dollars. Uh, just manufacturing, so not freight, not importing, if you import all those things, you want to sell like a retail price close to a thousand dollars in order to meet the sale margins. So uh, that was, uh, yes. And that's why you feel like, I don't know you, but I always felt like department store brands are so overpriced and they're always on sale because it's like the value doesn't match the price. I don't, I don't know if you ever felt this way, but. Um, and, and it's this whole game of overpricing it and, and then because you will sell it at a 40% discount, right? At the end of the day, that's all they do is that 40% discount. So, um, yeah, it's, it's the, 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 your margin strategy and your pricing strategy when you get into a wholesale is very important. Yeah. Which was my question. Yeah, like how do you work your markup prices for wholesale and what happened to the product that doesn't sell? In wholesale, like they don't sell it. Huh, you fight. <laughs> um, so, from what I know, um, retailers want to mark up between 2.2 to 2.7. So basically, if you sell them a garment for dollars, um, if you sell it to them, at a, they buy it for a hundred dollars. They're gonna want to sell it for 220 or 270 dollars. That's usually their markup. Um, at the end of the season, they will come to you with two things. Number one, I I have like 10 units that I haven't sold. What are we going to do about it? Um, and you say, well, that's not my problem. We bought them. <laughs> right? um, and they're going to say, you know what? If you want me to order again next year, you should take them back. And it's, oh. it's a very, you know, the, and I, I'm talking mostly about majors. I'm not generalizing to 
boutiques who are like usually a lot easier to work with. Um, but they're gonna ask you that. They're gonna be like, you know what? Let's RTV. Let's stay work. Like, they love to RTV. Yes. You know, we are going to this process of home sale now. And we have one like for six years. So we already have our you know basic line. But they want to buy and they want us to that the price on the website. So right now we're doing like selling a whole sample, but I've been doing a little bit just to be out there in a different environment. But at the same time, I can't put on the website and use their buying because I'm scared to lose the client that we that they are with us for six years. So I was like, should I keep going the wholesale or just do it on my own thing? So just to be clear, you're they're doubling the price. So do they end up being more expensive or they're less expensive than you on the retail price? They are very expensive, yeah. Oh, they, so it's not going to take away from your business. Yeah, but they don't pay. They, oh, they yeah. want to pay, like, let's say this was to 119 they would buy for the whole the wholesale price, but they want to sell more because they're a boutique in my town. It's tired from New York. Yeah, I do. <laughs> yeah, I know what to do. Just crazy. Yeah, I think that's that's why I think a lot of brands end up increasing their prices, their retail prices, in order to be able to match those margin goals that the retailers have and that you have also. You still still need to make money out of that, right? You can't sell that to them at cost. So it's it's again the pricing strategy when you get into wholesale is um, it's quite important. Um, and uh, you know, as just a piece of advice, I think it's it's um, you have to take into account costs that you don't even know of because of what I was telling you, those end of season. And they're going to tell you also, we had to discount your product by forty percent. Can you partner? They love to partner. <laughs> Can you partner with us on that? I'm like, you know, like do your job, sell it at full price. Like you decided to put it on the discount. Why should I pay for it? Um, so there's a lot of like, there's a lot of back and forth and a lot of unexpected costs associated with doing wholesale. So it can be dangerous, to be honest. It can be like a bad business decision if you're not prepared. Uh, but it also can be a, a good one because like, listen, you're getting new customers. You're, you're at a department store. So you're like, you're, uh, your production costs are going down because you can manufacture more. That is a very important, you know, it's a very important factor when you're doing things at scale. Like, what, you know, if it costs you a hundred dollar per piece to make it to manufacture a dress, uh, if you make ten dresses, but if you make two hundred dresses, that price will be the same. So, um, it's also interesting for like from a finance perspective. And in wholesale, what percentage they pay you? Like at Cutlery, as you were saying, you were there. Like, what percentage? Is it like 50 50 or how does it work? Oh, they don't give you anything when they first order. No. Anything? No. And what's your like? They, so they want to pay you. I'll give you an example. Uh, market is, winter market, for winter market is in February, right? Uh, they're going to place orders in February. Uh, you're going to manufacture those orders and deliver them in September, right? Um, they're not going to pay you until October, most likely November. So between February and November, you have to finance everything if you sell. And that's the usual model. That's the usual model. And none of their retail. They never pay you anything in advance. Not even a percentage, so you don't feel like. What if they change their mind? Or do you sign anything? Yes. Uh, purchase order is a legal document um, that binds them to, you know, to purchase the good. However, they, you know, sometimes they manage to cancel even if even if they're not technically legally allowed to. They're, they're like, happen. It hasn't happened to us a lot, but it has happened. It's a, yeah, it, it, it's a headache. It's, it's, a, it's a 
it's a headache, but it's uh, again, it's uh, and, and some people, some designers just decide never to deal with that. They're like, ah, life is too short. Like, you know, but for me, and I, I totally respect it. It's just, it was just our experience. We, we like, we wanted to grow wholesale and direct consumer together um, to give us a better chance to. Uh, to be honest, to survive as a brand, as a business, you know, when COVID hit, like wholesale was very slow, but then wholesale went back up and DTC was lower. So we give us a better chance to grow. Well, then we had a question over there. Oh, yeah. Hi. I have a quick question. How do you keep your price um, across the board looking at a lot of different retailers? Because I know when they buy wholesale, they usually mark off. Yes. Is there like a consistent? when you're selling in different stores and yourself as well? Yeah, we, so we give them, so on the line sheets that we, you know, we distribute and we communicate, obviously there's a wholesale price. Again, I'll give you an example. On our case, like the wholesale price is $100 and we're going to put MSRP, which is um, like suggested retail. They obviously can retail it to the price that they want to. We, don't enforce any policies, but we give them an MSRP, which is, uh, in our case, multiplied by 2.5. So if they're buying at 100, uh, they're selling at 250. And then we also have on our own website, we have to align to that same retail price, um, which can be like, you know, sometimes a bit challenging. So it's like kind of like five rank. Like trying to get that pretty much to match up well. Yes, it is too much. You, you definitely cannot offer your product on direct to consumer, meaning that I was going to say like, you're selling so low on your website at cheaper than your partners because you're you're not setting them up for success. It's not fair to them either. So you have to align with them. Yeah, and we'll take a last question there, and then Emily will be available for a few more questions. Uh, you have to have in person. Uh, my name is Natalie, and I'm a CX strategist. I'm on the other side. Uh, I get consumers to buy. Uh, and uh, so I just have a question about strategy for you. Um, so it was a warning to me. You said that if you, if the you know, wholesaler buys your product and then it doesn't sell, right? They were intrigued to, want to buy the product. They love the brand. Now it's in the store. But then it doesn't sell. And so then they come back to all these different types of partnership courts and everything like that. Do you have any strategies for the... Um, retail associates in the store. Mm -hmm. I mean, even coming to New York, I would go to a bunch of different boutiques and I would be interested in the product. And, you know, the customer just isn't enthused, maybe the product has been there for quite some time. And oftentimes you could be missing sales just based on the customer service in the store. So for brands that are coming up who might not have the ability to have a large social media following or paying influencers, how do you do uh, boutiques allow you to come in, not on a pop-up experience when everyone's expecting you to be there, but maybe like a secret, like retail person or something. How do you ensure that your brand is being promoted at the highest level? Yeah, no, it's, a, it's a great question. It's something that takes a lot of my mental space is um, not only how, how do we maximize sell throughs because that, that if there's one important metrics for retailers is your sell through this is how they're going to judge if you're um if you're successful at their store or not um so a sell through let's say if you're 80 percent sell through it means that they sold 80 percent of what they bought from you which is good um i mean for some of that so we're we, we partner in, in different ways uh we um Specialty stores and boutiques are very important to us. I've, I've talked a lot about department stores because uh, the conversation went there. But specialty boutiques are very important to us. And they're very important not only for like sales, but also for um, like marketing and, and customer building and all those things. So we do, with boutiques, we do a lot of trunk shows, meaning that they're not, this is not wholesale, they're not buying. But we're going to bring them our collection and for like a weekend or like a week and um, the customers are going to be able to experience the product. Whatever was sold, the, 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 the boutique will buy at a wholesale price. So it's a great way to um, to start with a, like a specialty store that you really like. Like if you, you really like this boutique and you're like, I wish I was sold there, but they won't buy. 
you can offer them to do a trunk show. There's basically no risk for them because they're not putting any money up front. Um, you get to meet their clients, a great marketing, you know, marketing initiative. And uh, and then maybe if, if it's success, they're gonna be like, hey, like actually I wanna bring some of your products in the store. So uh, those are always great. And you know, like any scale of business, I think those are great. Um, for department stores, it's a bit more complicated because as you said, you know, you, you get roadblocks. Like you ask the buyer, you're like, hey, can I, you know, can I, um, can I come into the store and redo the visual merch? It's, it's not great into your like flagship. Like it doesn't look great for my product. Like can I rearrange it? They're like they don't really want that. They don't really care to be honest. Um, and what we thought is that there's a couple of things that can be successful: doing product trainings, um, and they don't need to be very formal. But it's really more like meeting the people who are going to interact with your product, the sales associate, and telling them your story telling them, you know, like the key items about your products to be able to currently answer um, customers and uh, and creating a link like with the brand, like they're dealing with 100 brands, you know, like you want them to bond with your brand and be able to promote it. Uh, so those product trainings are super important, they're great. Whenever we're allowed to do them, uh, like we just do it. We usually do it very early in the morning. Uh, a department source. Uh, we're, you know, as you said, there's like, you know, any pop up opportunities, like any anything that we can do extra, like we do it. Like this is super important, especially in the current retail environment, when <clears throat> department stores are cutting down on the number of brands that they they have. Like it's really important to show that you are committed to their success and like the success together. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much.